And we want to welcome everyone tonight. You're listening to Prophecy Quake. I am your host tonight, Pastor Dean Odell, along with my co-host, Pastor Kevin Wilkinson. Uh, we welcome you to this uh, live edition. We are live here in East Central Alabama, right down the road from Auburn University. Uh, it is June 20th already, 2017. And uh, tonight we're going to dig into something I don't think... I've talked about in detail on this program or in any messages over the last few years. I have touched on the subject of preterism as a view of eschatology, but tonight we're going to talk about it in detail and where it originated from. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about the Jesuit deception of preterism. And yes, I mean the Roman Catholic Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, the trained infiltrators and assassins of the Roman Catholic Church. We're going to look at that tonight, but uh, we're going to look at this issue of preterism because the Lord's been laying it on my heart for some time to really deal with this in depth, but I'm just busy and trying to address things and been, you know, going back and preparing for the uh, teaching I'm going to do on Freemasonry. I had to dig back further because, of, of course, the Jesuits are the top of the food chain when it comes to secret societies and powerful societies and the ruling, you know, secret society. And so I started going back into the Jesuit issue and, and just happened to stumble across the fact. I, I didn't even know this until recently, just a few days ago, maybe a week ago, talking with a friend of mine about the uh, how many people within uh, and we're talking about well-known people within the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal movement, are into this idea of preterism uh, as a as theology. And so I'm just, you know, I know uh, I've tried to, again, I've tried to to just teach, you know, what the Lord gives, but um, it just, I, I realize this is so widespread, it needs to be addressed in detail. Uh, now listen, for those of you out there watching, I don't know if you're watching by YouTube tonight, Facebook Live, uh, listening to the audio on Blog Talk Radio or Mix LR. We welcome all of you tonight. Um, I hope everything is working and everybody's hearing clearly. Let us know on the different uh, mediums out there if you can't hear, if there's a sound problem, uh, because Kevin uh, is usually pretty quick to be able to get on that and fix that unless the problem is on their end. But anyway, tonight we're going to look at uh, the Jesuit deception of preterism, as I've already told you, and you're going to be kind of shocked because... I mean, believe it or not, there are a lot of people that believe that there are not any Bible prophecies today that point toward the return of Jesus Christ. I mean, they actually claim that Jesus came in 70 AD and that all the end time Bible prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD. And that means everything in Matthew 24, Luke 21, all the Old Testament prophecies concerning Israel in the last days. Uh, they teach that the church has replaced Israel and that God is done with the Jews. Um, I, I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm kind of blown away at how far this has gone. Um, of course, they also teach that we're already in the eternal age or the millennial reign, that uh, Jesus is ruling and reigning in the church in spirit, uh, and that we are, we've been given dominion. I mean, many in the charismatic movement, they have di different names for this. Listen, I read... Uh, Earl Palk, who had a you know a mega church in Atlanta back years ago, I, I read in the late '80s this thing. He had, a, he had a book called Ultimate Kingdom, and back then they were calling it Kingdom Now theology. Um, I remember I was with Bob and Rose Weiner for a while, and uh, you know they got into the. I, I heard Rose teach Dominion theology. I even think uh, Bob has a book called Take Dominion. And uh, it's been called many different things. I think one of the things it's been called to the manifest sons of God, and it's kind of uh, touches on some of this. Um, what's the other one? I mean, the new breed, that's another name for it, of course. And then more recently, uh, it's being called the seven mountain mandate. But it's it's the same basic theology, uh, especially concerning the end times. Now, let me preface tonight by saying this, that just because I named some names and some people that teach these things, and though I disagree, I don't mean to say, and I'm trying to say all of them are bad or false prophets or whatever, or false teachers, or that we, you know, just because we have a disagreement on some of these people are uh, good brothers and sisters in Christ, well-intentioned, and so it's that's that's not about it. But 
as a, a pastor, as a shepherd in the kingdom of God, as a fivefold ministry teacher. Um, the Lord's always called me to go deeper. And listen, it's one thing to preach something. It's one thing to teach something. Um, the, the very basic premise of this or the very basic idea that the church should go into the world and be an influence that I'm going to talk. And I'm talking, when I say the church tonight, I'm talking about true Christianity. I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic church at all. They, they're, they're not even part of the true church. I know that shocks some of you out there. You don't, you think I'm being harsh, but, um, I, this 30 years of studying church history and Roman Catholicism and all of this stuff, you know, I can just tell you. I mean, I have a book I showed Kevin. I bought this book right here in, it's called The Vatican Moscow Washington Alliance by Avro Manhattan. This book was published in 1986. I bought it in 1988. I mean, it's, it's faded, but of course, great book. He says here, the Vatican plays a vital part in history and world politics, as well as biblical prophecy. God reveals her true identity in chapters 17 and 18 of the book of Revelation. Uh, this is the big reason why, not this book, I say, but the big reason that we need to understand um, who came up with this idea of preterism, what it believes, and what it's doing in the church today, in Christianity today, it's it's really a doctrine that is not preparing the church for what is about to come on the world. I mean, the prophecies that are coming to pass, I mean, they don't even believe in end time prophecies. They actually believe things are getting better and better and that the church is going to Christianize the world. Now, don't get me wrong. Like I said before, I think it's a good thing for the church. We should at work, at school, politics, business, in every field. I think we should try to be a light and a witness and an influence, and that we should take the gospel of Jesus Christ into every facet of society, every facet of the culture, and try to make an impact, try to lead them to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but and also try to lead them into biblical morality and ethics. All of that is good. Um, but when we begin to, to teach things like uh, the church is going to take over the world, system is going to get better and better, um, we're not really looking for a physical second coming of Jesus, a rapture or resurrection of the righteous dead. Um, we're not looking for the great tribulation, uh, the rise of the Antichrist, the rise of the global world government system, the new world order. When, when we have a theology that just throws all that out and goes, I, I don't believe, I believe all that was fulfilled in 70 AD and ignores so many of the passages of scripture and the details, we do have a problem because so many people are not going to be ready. Um, they're not going to be ready for the level of deception uh, that, that comes onto the scene that God's warned us about. And he wanted us to be ready and to understand who the players are in this great end time uh, global deception of Satan. So it's, it's just so vitally important that we rightly divide the word of God, that we don't just take a passage here or a passage there, and that's how we build some theology off of it. Or we get so spiritual that everything's alleg allegory and, and metaphors, and we don't take anything literal. Listen, folks, there was a literal Jesus who died on the literal cross, who shed literal blood, who rose from the dead, literally, physically rose from the dead, who ascended physically into heaven, up, and uh, went into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. That's literal. And the angel said, he shall so come again in like manner as you've seen him go. So if he went up with his resurrected body physically into heaven, he's going to return again the same way physically. Every eye shall see him. And it says that that's in the Bible says that that's going to happen in a time when everything in the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, the great tribulation. But yet the preterist view says, no, everything's going to be better and better, and the world's going to be so wonderful and so Christianized that, uh, yeah, some of them believe Jesus will come again. Some of them don't. They say, you know, more they have a spiritual view of it. But anyway, we're going to dig into this tonight. Now we have uh, Kevin's going to be putting up some PowerPoint slides because I want you to see um, these quotes. We're going to be going through some many scriptures, we're going to be looking at church history, but we're going to be looking at what preterism is, 
where it came from. And listen, folks, I'm going to tell you, I've been watching this for over 30 years now. The Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuit order, has they have been infiltrating every f- aspect of the Protestant church in a sense too. They, they realized back after the Reformation and the Inquisitions and all that, that persecution, physical persecution, and trying to, you know, stamp out Protestant Christianity by force and violence, that that was too ugly and backfired and Protestant, true Protestant evangelical Christianity just grew and grew and grew and grew. So they created the Jesuit order to infiltrate Christianity and to slowly but surely and methodically change the spiritual exercises and practices, begin to shift things into occultism. Um, I talked about that a lot in my book, The Polluted Church, but that was the whole direction of Ignatius Loyola, who started the Jesuits in the Roman Catholic um, order. But the whole purpose of the Jesuits was to stamp out the Protestant Reformation, to stamp out Protestants and to infiltrate. And a lot of people don't even understand that that mission of the Jesuits is ongoing to this day. And they do it by many different means. But the most what they've done is they've infiltrated our Bible schools, our, um, you know, big churches, uh, seminaries, um, even, you know, uh, secular universities and colleges. And they have introduced the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church uh, so as to prepare this final generation for the great deceptions to come. But uh, anyway, let's dig into this. We're going to uh, get into it. And first, you know, I want to put up our first slide here, the Jesuit deception of preterism. And I, and I put down at the bottom of the slide, if you can see it, and Kevin, you might want to put the whole thing up there for them. Um, it says that the preterism or the doctrine of preterism was created by a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest. And we'll get to that in the, in the early 1600s. But it was created to destroy the impact and warnings of end-time Bible prophecy and to deflect and obscure the fact that the Protestant reformers had correctly identified the Roman Catholic Church as the great whore, Mystery Babylon of Revelation 17 and 8. Now, this is a a historical fact. Martin Luther, um, all of them, John Knox, I mean, I could go down the list, even later on, John Wesley, they all identified the Roman Catholic Church, as the great horror, Mystery Babylon. And it's not hard to do, but the devil has worked very hard to deceive, mislead, create doctrines, false doctrines about who is Mystery Babylon. Um, But it's it's very well documented and easy to expose. Now, that's not, I can't do all that tonight because uh, I've done it that before where, you know, Revelation 17 proves uh, all the clues if you follow them the way they're written. It is the Roman Catholic Church, even into chapter 18. It's not the United States of America. It's not just the world system, the secular system. It's not uh, Israel or Jerusalem in 70 AD. No, it's the Roman Catholic Church uh, that came into being through Constantine in around 313 AD. But, of course, he just changed uniforms from the Roman Empire to a religious outfit and began his work that way. But let's... Let's look at, so let's look at again is what is the definition? I'm going to give you a, a detailed definition here is what is the doctrine of preterism? Now, there's full preterist and there's partial preterist. So, um, I'm just going to cover pretty much most of all what they agree on and their beliefs. Some may vary just slightly, but preterism teaches that there are not any Bible prophecies today that point forward to the return of Jesus Christ. They say that Jesus came in 70 AD in spirit, I guess, or something. Thus, all, they say, because of that, all of Matthew 24 and Luke 21 were fulfilled then in 70 AD. They claim that the whole world saw Jesus come in the clouds. Now, there's no historical evidence of this. There's no historical record that all the tribes of the earth, as the Bible says, all will see him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see him. There's no witness of that in history of that happening. But this is what the preterists have to claim to claim that every that all Bible prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD. And I'm gonna as we get through this, you'll see it's ridiculous. This is this is really a ludicrous idea, uh theology. It really is. It's um 
it, it's insane, and I can't believe that there are so many Christian leaders out there, pastors and Christian leaders, and some men who I say love Jesus but are so very deceived and deceiving people and teaching stuff that's clearly not biblical. Now, this goes on. They say that Nero, the emperor Nero, in the first century was the beast and the man of sin foretold in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. They teach that the end of the world or the end of the age refers to the end of the Jewish world in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and Israel was scattered. Um, it was the last days, they say, of the old system. They claim the fall of Babylon refers to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans and, of course, they teach replacement theology, that God replaced Israel with the church. All the promises uh, to Israel now, they say, belong to the church. And get this, some of them say Satan is already bound in the abyss and unable to hinder the spread of the gospel. Really? Have they? I wonder if these people, if they've checked what's been going on in the Middle East. Go, go try to spread the gospel in Iraq or Syria right now, and you'll find out that it's not only being hindered, but absolutely, almost absolutely extinguished, wiped out. Um, same thing in other countries. I mean, Egypt, the, the Muslims are trying to completely erase Christianity. Now, they also say that the end of the age, uh, the, the end of the age resurrection slash rapture of the righteous mentioned in Revelation 7 has already happened. So this is a few things that they say, and again, that way they can say these things, and that way they can dismiss anything that you bring up and you start talking about Bible prophecy. Now, the problem, one of the major problems that preterists have when you say all of Bible prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD, and that Jesus came and... um <laughs> That Jesus came and, you know, that's it. And we're in the millennial reign and Satan is bound and we're, the gospel is going to make the, the world a perfect place. Just the, that the church is going to make the world a perfect place and, um, everything's going to get better and better. Now that, of course, that's ridiculous. That, but now one of the problems they have is that the book of Revelation, right? That, goes into detail of things written in Isaiah and Joel and Zechariah and uh, all, you know, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all these things were that the book of Revelation kind of compiles it all together, all the things that the Lord Jesus prophesied when he was here about the end and what will happen right up close, you know, leading up to his second coming, Armageddon and all that. Um, we know that John the, John, the Apostle John wrote the book of <laughs> Revelation in 95 AD, you know, maybe early 96 at the latest. And this is confirmed by Polycarp, who was one of John's disciples, who later discipled Irenaeus. And church history documents the fact that the book of Revelation was done in 95 AD. So one of the biggest problems for preterism is the book of Revelation and that it was written in 95 AD. Thus, preterists insist, they, they just claim, they insist on an early date for the book of Revelation so they can attribute everything in it to what happened when uh, Titus storm, you know, besieged Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem and the, the temple in 70 AD. However, again, I'm going to say it, early disciples of John, the apostle John, like Polycarp and later Irenaeus, made it clear that John wrote Revelation in the very late first century. Um, let's, let's look at some of those. Uh, talking about Irenaeus and, and Polycarp here. And goodness, I was in such a hurry. I'm sure I got some, I have a few typos in this tonight. But uh, anyway, I'm just trying to get all this done today after traveling. But uh, here it says this. Uh, Irenaeus says John's vision in Revelation was towards the end of Domitian's Rain. Now, I, I, Domitian or whatever, I don't know how you pronounce it. Some of you may out there may know. But the Roman Emperor Domitian uh, reigned from 81 AD to 96 AD. So here, you know, Irenaeus, the disciple of Polycarp, who was the direct disciple of John and the bishop and pastor of the church Smyrna, um, says that the book of Revelation was written towards the end 
of Domitian's reign, the emperor. So that would put it at 95 AD, towards the end, 95 to 96 AD. Um, of course, Irenaeus lived 120 to 2002 AD. He was trained under Polycarp of Smyrna. In fact, he heard him speak as a youth. And uh, Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John and the bishop of the Church of Smyrna in Asia Minor. According to Polycarp, the book of Revelation was written. Now listen to this. Polycarp, a direct trained disciple. I mean, Polycarp was like John's Timothy. To, you know, as Timothy was to Paul, Polycarp was to John. And in his epistle, in Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians, Polycarp states that his church at Smyrna did not exist in the days of the Apostle Paul before the destruction of Jerusalem. So when the Apostle John addresses the church of Smyrna in the first few chapters of Revelation, he's addressing a church that did not come into existence until after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. So there's two witnesses right there. Of course, uh, one of the most well-known apologists of the you know early second century, Irenaeus, he writes this. I mean, in his, and this was about 180 AD. Again, he was a disciple of Polycarp, traced right back to John. He says, history tells us uh, here that Revelation was written late in the first century in Irenaeus' work entitled Against Heresies, and this is his most well-known work. In chapter 13, verse 18, Irenaeus tells us that when John had his vision and wrote the book, he said, for that, referring to John's vision, he said, Irenaeus said, quote, we will not, however, incur, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of the Antichrist, for if it were necessary uh, that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision. For that was seen not very long time since, but also in our day towards the end of Domitian's reign. So he tells you, again, that don't speculate, he says, at this time about the name of the Antichrist. And here he's talking about this in 180 AD as if it has not happened. And then he gives us the date of the writing of the book of Revelation of the Apocalypse of John. Uh, the apocalypse of the Lord Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the book. So he tells us again, it was toward the end of Domitian's reign, which would put it around AD 95. Now here, Irenaeus, in the same uh, series of books, five books of St. Irenaeus here, he, uh, this is book five, I guess it's something there, 30, I can't see it. But anyway, this is what he says here. He says, it is therefore more certain and less hazardous to await the fulfillment of prophecy than to make surmises and casting about for any names that might present themselves insomuch as many names can be found possessing the number. And he was talking about people running around just calculating the gematria, the number, the numbers of the letters of the name, coming up with people whose names were 666. He goes, that's just foolishness. I remember people have been doing that for, for years. I mean, they said Ronald Reagan's name added up to 666. Who cares? That's not, he's saying that's just not the issue. But he goes on to say that um, he said the same, it'll, it'll basically remain unsolved. But he indicates that the number of the name now, that when this man comes. So here is Irenaeus in 180 AD saying when this man comes. So here, again, early church father, pre-Roman Catholic church. I mean, this is way pre. Roman Catholic church did not come into the picture until 313 AD. So here, pre-Roman Catholic Church, pre-any, you know, this is outside of the Gnostics. These are the true church fathers that carried on the true faith for us and wrote all this stuff down and fought the heresies. This book that Irenaeus wrote against heresies was fighting the heresies of Simon Magus, the magician from the book of Acts, and Marcion and the Gnostics and all that stuff. He was, he was fighting false teaching, heresy. And he's telling us here that when this man comes, when the Antichrist comes, and then he says this, but he goes on, but when this Antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three years and six months. He will sit in the temple at Jerusalem. Then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds in the glory of the Father, sending this man, 
and those who follow him into the lake of fire, but bringing in for the righteous the times of the kingdom, that is the rest, the hallowed seventh day, and restoring to Abraham the promised inheritance in which the kingdom the Lord declared that many coming from the east and from the west should sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this is Irenaeus talking in 180 AD about these things will come to pass. He didn't believe they had already happened. So Polycarp, Irenaeus, there's another one, um, the shepherd of, of Hermes or something like that, or Hermaeus or whatever, he said the same thing. So again, I, again, I could belabor this point and we could just keep going through different ones. But uh, suffice it to say that the early church fathers, we're talking about, you know, the end of the first century into the first, you know, the beginning of the second century, they plainly taught that the the prophecies concerning the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist, the Armageddon, the Great Deception, even the false signs and wonders that would come between from the Antichrist and the false prophet and the, the, the mark of the beast. I mean, they were talking about those things. They're coming in the future, not they are. They happened in 70 A.D. So, it, it, I mean, just one thing itself. We're just talking right now about church history and the date of the book of Revelation. Now, there's another book called the Didache, and the Didache it was used as a church manual. Pretty much everyone agrees that it was written uh, the latest by 100 A.D. So this was written in the first century as a manual um, for churches. It's kind of like this is how we do things. This is what we believe. And it taught that end-time Bible prophecy concerning the Antichrist, persecution, false signs and wonders, and the resurrection of the righteous or the rapture was still in the future. Uh, so let's read it. This is from the Didache. This is... Uh, Number 16 there. All right, let's look. He says, watch for your life's sake. Let not your lamps be quenched, nor your loins unloosed. Be ye ready, for you not you know not the hour in which our Lord cometh. For in the last days false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied, and the sheep shall be turned into wolves, and love shall be turned into hate. For when lawless, lawlessness increases, they shall hate and, per and persecute and betray one another. And then shall appear the world deceiver as son of God. And he shall do signs and wonders. And the earth shall be delivered into his hands. And he shall do iniquitous things uh, which have never yet come to pass since the beginning. And then shall appear the sign, the signs of truth. First, the sign of the outspreading in heaven. And then the sign of the sound of the trumpet. And third, the resurrection of the dead. Yet not of all, but as it is said, the Lord shall come and all his saints with him. Then the world will see the Lord coming upon the clouds of heaven. So here is something written in the first century, written probably even after Revelation that says these things have not happened in 70 AD. These things are going to happen in the future. Um, now let's, let's, let's look at where this doctrine originated from. Okay, and I said it earlier, but here it is, the Jesuit priest. Now remember, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, were created by Ignatius Loyola, a devout soldier. He was a knight. He was a, he was a soldier in the Crusades. He went to the Pope, and he requested to create a new order under, that would be under complete devotion to the Pope and that their mission would be by any means necessary to stamp out Protestant Christians and to bring all back under submission to the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Pontiff. And, of course, the Pope gave the blessing. Now, this false, this, this false teaching that I'm talking about tonight, preterism, was created by this... Uh, <laughs> Jesuit priest. This is in the late 1600s, I mean early 1600s. So we're talking about right after the Jesuits began. This became part of the agenda because it was very important. They had to counter the reformers. Now listen to this. The false doctrine, uh, this false doctrine of preterism was invented in the early 1600s by a Jesuit named Luis del Alcazar. It was to conquer the reformers, or to counter rather, the reformers' claim 
that the Roman Catholic Church was the great whore of Mystery Babylon writing the beast in Revelation 17 and 18. Alcazar uh, wrote a book called The Investigation of the Hidden Sense of the Apocalypse. See, this is where it all began to try to allegorize or spiritualize away the things in the book of Revelation to make it a spiritual allegory instead of literal things that were going to happen in the future. Um, but it taught, now listen to this, it taught that the entire book of Revelation was about pagan Rome and the first 600 years of the New Testament church. Now this is a very slick way of introducing false doctrine because it does talk a little bit about pagan Rome because pagan Rome did persecute the apostles and so on. But if you look at Revelation 17 and 18 and the judgment that's going to come on the great whore, it talks about how she became a cup of idolatry, that she became a religion, not just a political system. And again, you have to know a little bit of history that uh, Constantine, when he decided to change and become Christian, he just slapped his soldiers and said, hey, now you're Christians. And now, you know, believe this. And, and, and basically everybody thinks it was wonderful because he stopped the persecution. But what he did was is he created a false religion that, was, that he claimed was Christian and to bring people out and into this thing. And that's how the Roman Catholic Church began. Now, I know that's not what they will tell you, but that's the history. 313 A.D., Constantine takes off the military garb, the political garb, puts on the religious robes. We're Christians now, and it becomes a state religion. Now, it says here in this book here by this Jesuit priest, Alcazar, or Alcazar, it says he taught the belief that the world system would gradually improve over time by the influence of the church and become Christianized and ready for the second coming of Christ. All of the prophecies in Revelation, he said, except for Revelation 20, uh, 4 through 22 and 21, he said all these were fulfilled in 70 AD, and he claimed that Jesus Christ returned. Now listen to this. He claimed that Jesus Christ returned in 70 AD in the person of the Roman armies to destroy Jerusalem and disperse Israel. What is mind-blowing is that most preterists believe this today. Now, this is what, that's mind-blowing to me. I remember Jesus saying, if you go back and you look at Matthew 24, I remember Jesus saying, if he say, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth, or he is in secret chambers. I'm going to show you how ridiculous this is. Jesus did not come in 70 AD. Certainly, he did not come in the person of the Roman armies to destroy Israel. He didn't, he didn't, and not everyone saw him and, and, and so on and so forth. And of course, it, it's so wild because if, if you believe, now listen to this, if you believe that 70 AD was it and we, and Jesus came back then and we entered into the eternal realm, the millennial reign of, that's supposed to be of peace and prosperity and all this, man, the world went through horror, the dark ages, the, the, you know, 600 to 700 and the rise of Islam and then the slaughter that followed Islam and, you know, just the dark ages through the 800s and 900, you know, it wasn't better at all. But uh, that, that's just mind blowing that they that's what they believe. But this is a picture of the actual book that was printed back in, uh, I guess it was 1614. And um, this was their the the theology that they decimate you know put everywhere, disseminated I should say all over the the area and all over the world to teach their doctrine. Now, for those of you not aware, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Jesuits. I had planned to do a real in depth teaching on the Jesuits at some point in the near future, but it's just important to know. You can do your own research, but. Um, here's a book, uh, the, the truth triumphant. This is page 381. Um, and that's a picture of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits it says here, quote from this book, he said, when it seemed as if the church of Rome were mined and crushed by the reformation, the order of the Jesuits was formed the most powerful and cruel of all the orders within the papacy. It undertook, first of all, to capture colleges and universities, then to climb to power in the state, 
It succeeded in dominating certain nations and in persecuting with unspeakable cruelty that Protestantism which it in was in <laughs> uh, invented to destroy. So it was intended to destroy, rather. So he, I mean, boom, you got that right there. I mean, the quotes of people. Here's Samuel Morse of the Morse Code. Uh, he said here, the Jesuits are a secret society, a sort of Masonic order uh, with super added features of revolting odiousness and a thousand times more dangerous. I mean, these guys knew. I mean, and of course, Hitler, he loved them and he incorporated their methods within his own. He says, I have learned most of all from the Jesuit order. So far, there has been nothing more imposing on earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. A good part of that organization have I transported direct to my own party. And I mean, this is... Uh, Adolf Hitler quote taken from Edmund Paris's book, The Vatican Against Europe. And I mean, it just goes on down the line. I mean, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Charles Chinicky was a Roman Catholic priest who came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior and finally left the Roman Catholic Church and was a powerful man, wrote many books. He wrote the book 50 Years in the Church of Rome. Uh, man, you want to talk about something? You can download these books for free. Um, his book, the what is it, The Church, The Woman, and The Confessional. Wow. Um, just some awesome books. He became good, very close friends with Abraham Lincoln. In fact, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln tried to recruit Charles Chinicky to be a, a spy for him at the Vatican. But uh, Charles Chinicky de declined because he wouldn't leave his new flock he had to shepherd that he was pulling out of uh, these people out of the Roman Catholic Church. And so it says here, this is a quote from 50 year, years in the Church of Rome, and I've had that book for years. But after 20 years of constant and most difficult research, uh, Charles Chinicky says, I, have, I come to fearlessly today before the American people to say and to prove that President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by the priests and Jesuits of Rome. Um, and this is because Abraham knew the truth about him. He was trying to stop him. And the Jesuits, uh, Abraham Lincoln, of course, knew the Jesuits were behind the Civil War, pushing it from the South to try to divide and get control of the United States. Now, all of this was confirmed many years ago. Um, Alberto Rivera, or Rivera um, who was a Jesuit priest, um, was born again. And I want to tell you, you can find the testimony of him being filmed on YouTube, his books, um, and and this here, I mean, the this is it, it's just an amazing story. I'm glad God led me to this story of of Alberto uh, Rivera, you know, right after I rededicated my life to the Lord in 1987, and fascinating. You just weep over when you read the whole testament. What brought him out? I mean, he was brought up from a child in this, picked to be a priest, and trained to be a Jesuit. Um, he, he came out, when he came out, it was because of what they were doing to his sister. Um, and, uh, and he came out with all the documentation of stuff. There's no way that he could have had unless he was truly a Jesuit. And there's pictures of him teaching in the school. This is uh, just some of the stuff. Here's some of uh, his ID card that was issued by the Spanish government in Spain in 1967 under the rule of the Spanish dictator Franco. Uh, his security forces were equally as strict as the Gestapo had been in Germany. To obtain this document, Alberto had to supply birth certificate, identification pa papers, and positive proof from his archdiocese of being a priest. So Alberto could not have possibly forged this doc document. Security was very strict. And, of course, he went to Jack Chick and shared his entire testimony and they, you know, they put it in books and videos and he, he traveled a lot and spoke about, shared his testimony of how he came to know Jesus Christ in a very real way and how evil and dark, uh, not only the Roman Catholic Church is full of idolatry and deception, but how dark and evil and, uh, the, the Jesuits are. And, and he was taught and trained to infiltrate Protestant schools, seminaries, Bible schools, churches, and denominations to begin to take them over. Now, I want to read a little bit. We'll read the Jesuit oath here, and this is only part of it, okay? 
Now, this was made um, public. <laughs> it was put in the public rep record from a congressional hearing, and I can't remember now. But you can, again, everything I'm saying you guys can find. This is stuff that, uh, you know, I've known for decades, but uh, it's all documented out there. But this is part of the Jesuit oath uh, for the Counter-Reformation War. He says, I further promise, and this is one of the, oh, this is the oath taken in the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta. Um, other orders take these, these very similar oaths. But he says, I further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, nor condition, that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up their stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the wall in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the uh, poignard or the dagger, the lead of the bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be the, their condition in life, either public or private, as at any time they may be directed to do so by the agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus or the Jesuit General. So these guys are, are these are the hardcore guys. These are the, again, the infiltrators, the deceivers, the assassins, um, a lot of people may criticize me for saying this, but I have no doubt that, uh, you know, Alberto was poisoned in after one of his speaking engagements and died. Um, I believe Keith Green, that his plane went down, was not an accident. He had just done the entire series, the Catholic Chronicles, where he exposed the Roman Catholic Church as the Whore of Babylon, what all the reformers said. Um, you can still find the Catholic Chronicles online through other sites. I, I, I have to say that uh, it's sad that his wife that took over Last Days Ministries took all that down. Um, Keith wouldn't have done that. Now, she says he was talking about doing it, but I know better. Um, but Keith exposed it in the Catholic Chronicles, and then his plane goes down and kills everybody on board, his private plane. Um, I have no doubt that these Jesuits were behind it. Um, that was in 1982. Now let's, let's jump back over to another thing. We read it a minute ago where the preterists say that, you know, um, Israel's return to the land. And, and this was just said to me the other day by a strong Christian. And, and, and he's heard this from, again, many leaders in the body of Christ, particularly the charismatic charismatic leaders and he he said this to me and we were talking and i'm just like wow but that these guys are saying that that israel's return to the land in 1948 the jews returning to the land and israel becoming a nation again has absolutely nothing to do with end time bible prophecy i am not joking now this is this was said to me not that this guy believes it but he was he was referring to these people that are teaching this stuff. And, he, and, he, and so as I began to share some things, he said, so you, you believe it, that Israel being in the land, that's, that's legit. That's for real. That's biblical prophecy fulfilled. Absolutely. And what I'm about to do is I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you how um, they're com this is a completely false idea here. Now, think about this. They say, the preterist, this doctrine that came from the, this Roman Catholic Jesuit, they say that God is finished with the Jews, and uh, because they, you know, after they rejected Jesus as the Messiah, I said, "Now, now think about this. This flies in the face and is completely opposite to what the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans." And we're going to read some of that in a minute. However, this demonic false teaching has been the position of the Roman Catholic Church for over a thousand years. Now, here's a documented letter. This is on June twenty second. 1943, Pope Pius, the, uh, what is that, the 12th, wrote to President Roosevelt, and this is what he said. Letting you know, this is the position of the Roman Catholic Church. 
He said it is true that at one time Palestine was inhabited by the Hebrew race, but there is no axiom in history to substantiate the necessity of people returning to a country they left 19 centuries before. So he was against the Jews. The, the Pope, Pius XII, was against the Jews coming back and having their own homeland. And this was the official policy of the Catholic Church. And if you don't believe me, here's a Washington Post article, uh, 1999. Documents discovered by Jewish group shows that at the height of World War II, Pope Pius XII warned against making Palestine a homeland for the Hebrew race and had no complaints, but, but yet he had no complaints about the Nazi occupation of Rome. The discovery of the documents in U.S. archives cast new light on a pope whose failure to speak out publicly against the persecution of the Jews during the war is still causing controversy, especially now that the Vatican is considering him for sainthood. In one document, a Vatican spokesman informed the administration of President Franklin Roosevelt that the Pope's help in saving 4,000 Slovakian Jewish children and getting them to Palestine must not be construed as a sign that he was in favor of setting up a Jewish homeland there. Um, it is uh, true that at one time, and there's the quote again from, it is true that one time Palestine was inhabited by the Hebrew race, but there is no axiom in history to substantiate the necessity of people returning to a country they left 19 centuries before, said the letter uh, uh, apostolic delegate to Washington Archbishop, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. But anyway, so there you have it. I mean, that was reported on. These documents found in the U.S. archives, letters from Pope Pius XII to President Roosevelt saying, hey, um, we're, we're not for this. This is not our policy. And, of course, I, can't, I don't even have time to get into how the Roman Catholic Church and their bishops and all the way up to the Pope during uh, pre-World War II and during World War II were in bed with the Nazis and completely in agreement and working with Hitler and Hitler with them. It's just, I mean, there's no, I mean, it's documented history. You're not going to hear it on CNN. You're not going to hear it on the History Channel because they're run by the controlled media, but it is true. Now, let's look at this issue, Israel in the last days, the ensign of God. When you're going to say something so dramatic as that, God is finished with the Jewish people, that, that's over, he's done with them, um, they're rejected and there's no hope and it's over and the church has completely replaced them. And when you say that, and yet the scriptures say something different, I'm sorry, that's a false teaching. It's, it's demonic and it's, and it's misleading people. It's deceiving people. It's leading people away from the truth of scripture. Israel becoming a nation in 1948 and then taking Jerusalem in 1967 is one of the most amazing Bible prophecies. I know there are people out there right now, oh, the Zionists this and the Zionists that. And, you know, I'm not saying that they're saved, that they're, you know, all of them, that, that they're all righteous and have all good intentions. There's bad Jews. There's good Jews. Um, just like there's bad Americans and there's good Americans. Um, that's not what we're getting at. What does the Bible say about this? And, and let's look at it. Well, let's, let's look at Romans chapter 11. And, you know, let's, let's just read a few verses because uh, this is powerful. I mean, if you're going to say God's done with Israel, he's finished with them, it's over. And yet, here's what the Bible says. Here's what Romans 11, 1 uh, through 2, he says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I am also, Paul said, I am also an, I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. I mean, how much more clear can you be? Kevin, how much more clear can that be? It'd be hard to be more clear. And then, you know, and, uh, you know, we need to turn there because I know I didn't post these verses, but still, let's just, I'm gonna, I want to turn and read just a few more. Because, folks, I'm telling you, I spent all day on this, and I, I still didn't even scratch the surface on everything that I wanted to get to here. But here's the scripture. I mean, I'm going to read it again. This is uh, Romans 11, 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I am also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. 
I mean, that's about as crystal clear as it gets. And then he tells us Gentiles over here, the Gentile Christians, go over to verse 18. He said, well, goodness, we'll just read from verse 13. He says, for I speak to you Gentiles insomuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh, that I might save some. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but the life from the dead? So he, he's connecting Israel being restored and the people coming to see Jesus as their Messiah as the time of the resurrection or the end. And he goes on to say, he says, For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree was grafted in among them, uh, and with them partakest of the root and fat of the olive tree. Listen to what he says right here, verse 18. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say, then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And he talks about this. And look at verse 25. Let's skip down to there. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. I mean, how much more brazenly boastful and prideful and arrogant can you be as a Gentile Christian to say, God's done with the Jews. And we're it. I mean, I don't even know what, you, what else you could say to be boastful and prideful. I mean, but he says here, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that the blindness in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, and I will take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, he's saying right now, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. So here he's plainly saying, I'm still working on them, and i got a plan for them, particularly in the end times. And we have people saying, no. Now let, let's just prove it even further. Because preterism, I'm, I'm telling you, preterism is demonic. Anything comes out of the Jesuits anyway is demonic. But preterism is completely against the Bible, and, and really what it is, I think a lot of it is just ignorance. They say enough that sounds good that, you know, a lot of people are deceived because they don't study these things in depth. Let's look at this. Let's look at what God says about Israel and about the last days and what he'll do. Now, this is important. This is Isaiah 11, verse 11 and 12. Now, here's what he says. Now, he says here, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. Everybody out there, you're watching, you're listening tonight, please read this in your Bible. And please pay close attention because he says that God's going to set his hand upon the Jewish people, the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham. He's going to set them the second time, two times, to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, from the islands of the sea. And he says when he does this, the second time, when he gathers these remnants of his people from the islands and from these different places, it says he shall set up an ensign. Now the, the word ensign, Hebrew, is the word neck. It means a flag, a signal, and a sign. He says, He shall set up an ensign for the nations, and he shall gather the outcast of Israel and gather them together, the dispersed of Judah, from the four corners of the earth. Now, everybody hear that. Tonight. You want to say God's done with Israel and, and that 
the there's nothing about Bible prophecy fulfilled when Israel became a nation again and God began to gather. And look, I went there in 1988 and I watched that. I was on a plane full coming from, I flew from Atlanta to Paris. And when I changed planes in Paris and we got, we're talking about European Jews. That plane was full of European Jews and two Americans. And we all went back to Israel. And I saw people getting off a plane and kissing the ground. So don't tell me. That I mean, that God was not. This is not a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. But God says here specifically, 750 B.C. to the prophet Isaiah, I'm going to gather the remnant of my people from that's been scattered. They've been dispersed. And remember, there was two dispersions of the Jewish people when the temple was destroyed and they were scattered to the four winds. There was two times. God says that I'm, when I when I move on the second time. This is the time I'm going to set them up. They're going to be a sign, a flag, a nation. It's going to be a sign to the nations of the world. And he says, and he shall set up an ensign, a flag, a signal, a sign for the nations. And he shall gather the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four winds. Now, as I said, when was the first time? The first time Israel's first scattering and return was 606 B.C., and they were in Babylonia. Nebuchadnezzar came in, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. And they were in captivity, in exile in Babylon for 70 years. Of course, there was a remnant left, but they were in captivity. God said 70 years. Then I'm going to bring you out in 70 years. You're going to return to the land. I'm going to bring you out, the outcast of Israel from the land of Babylon. I'm going to bring you out, and you're going to rebuild the temple and rebuild Jerusalem. And that was the whole story of Ezra, Nehemiah. And um, powerful. So 606 B.C., they were scattered the first time. Jerusalem destroyed. The temple destroyed. 536 B.C., 70 years later, they're turned loose from Babylon and kept to go back to the land and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. And so that was the first time. The second time was what everybody's talking about, you know, the predators 70 A.D., 70 AD, Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate. Um, they're going to come. They're going to destroy. Not one stone will be left upon another. There are parts of Jesus' prophecy where he talked about what was going to happen in 70 AD, but he, it, it's not all about that. And so it says the destruction of the temple happened, and the second diaspora or the second dispersion of the Jews happened in 70 AD. Jerusalem's destroyed. The temple's destroyed. And they're scattered for, you know, over 1,700 years. And then, by God's intervention, through many different ways, it started in 1917 with the British defeating the Ottoman Empire. There was a 50 years of a, a no man's land. Jerusalem laid waste and the land of Israel laid waste. Mark Twain talked about it being a, a wilderness but in May 1948, the state of Israel is born. It becomes a new nation overnight. Um, that's the Palestine Post. Here's the New York Times. Zionists proclaim new state of Israel. Truman recognizes it and hopes for peace. Immediately, Tel Aviv is bombed. Egypt orders invasion. And immediately, they went into war because their Muslim neighbors decided to attack them. And miraculously, uh, by God's help and God moving on different ones, I believe he helped them sustain it because it was to fulfill Bible prophecy. And then, of course, the, a huge thing was the Six-Day War in 1967 when Israel takes back Jerusalem. So what we have now is we have the two times that Israel, was they were judged by God, they were uh, driven into exile, the temple and the city destroyed. God brings them back, 536 B.C. It happens again in 70 A.D., but then God brings them back again the second time. Now, folks, if, if you're a preterist out there or you're borderline preterist, you really have to deny the details in Scripture. You, you have to deny the details, and you have to deny what this says. Now, if you believe 70 A.D. was the fulfillment of everything, here's the problem. Amos 9, 14 and 15. God speaks of a time here. 
He says, I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. And they shall make, uh, also make gardens and eat the fruit thereof. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of the land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. So again, 70 AD, when they were plucked up from the land, Israel, the Jewish people, were plucked up from the land, and they did no longer had the way cities built, and they no longer had vineyards there, and they no longer had gardens. That can't be the end of all things, folks. Do you see how ludicrous this is? How ridiculous? this teaching is it's unbelievable so 70 AD obviously shows this passage in Amos obviously shows there was going to be another restoration and when God restored them this final time they would never again be pulled out of the land and that's what the Bible shows us that there's going to be a remnant of Israel that's left after the tribulation, after the Antichrist, after the invasion, after Gog and Magog war, and all of those things that the Bible foretold. After that, there's going to be a remnant that all Israel that's left will be saved as the Messiah comes and they recognize the one in whom they've pierced and they will mourn for him, as we'll see in a moment. One more passage, and we're going to take a quick break. Here's something, you know, you want to say Israel as a nation done forever, you know, in 70 AD? Well, God's word says something a little different. Israel, he says, will be a nation forever. A nation forever. So that would have to be after he brought them back the second time. And this is what he says in the book of Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah 31, 35 through 37. Now God says to Jeremiah, giving the example, listen this, of the sun, the moon, and the stars. And he says this. He says, if those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So he said, if the sun, moon, and stars stop moving in their circuit, yes, them moving, not us. If the sun, moon, and stars ever stop moving in their circuit, then Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me. So he's saying, as long as the sun, moon, and stars exist and do what I've commanded them to do and follow their circuit, their ordinance. Israel will be a nation before me forever. You see that, Kevin? Is that me? He says, thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the fountains of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. So the Lord says, if you can measure the heaven above, or you can search out the depths of the earth. We've only been able to drill eight miles. Nobody knows how deep it goes, and nobody's been any further than that. He says, if you can do that, he says, guess what? Then I will cast off all the seed of Israel, meaning he has not, people. He is not done with the nation of Israel. He has a plan for them. Part of that plan was to bring them back, create them a nation again as a sign to the world of fulfilled Bible prophecy. Many of them, most of them, are not following Jesus as Lord and Messiah. They're going to be deceived by the Antichrist when they see themselves betrayed and when they see everything going to hell in a handbasket, the a remnant is going to turn. All that's left is going to turn to him. And he says that day when all Israel is saved, as, he, as Paul talked about a day at the end, with the, the children of Israel, he says, when all Israel is saved, that day is going to be the resurrection of the dead. That day is going to be the second coming. The resurrection of the dead, the rapture happens at the end. Jesus said in John 6, four times, he says, those that believe in me, that follow me, that are the righteous dead. He said, I'm going to raise him up at the last day. I mean, these folks that talk about um, 70 AD being it, listen, I, I'm a post-trib rapture guy, but I do believe in a rapture or a resurrection because Jesus said through the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, he said, hey, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we which are alive. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That did not happen in 70 AD. 
That did not happen. It couldn't happen. There were many more saints and believers to come that would live and die and need to be resurrected. That's why Jesus said in John 6 that he said, I'm going to raise them up on the last day. The last day of what? The last day of this age. The last day of, of the great tribulation period. Um, folks, here it is. Don't, don't even for a second believe the lie that God cast off his people that he foreknew, the Jews, the Hebrews, the, the, the Israel as being a nation. Don't think that he never intended for Israel to be a nation again. Oh, it's some it's because of the Zionist Jew conspiracy nuts and because you believe the false protocols of the elders of Zion. I'm so sick of the propaganda out there. Listen, folks, a lot of stuff in the truth movement. I'm all about the truth movement. I'm all about truthers. I am a truther. But not all of the information out there is true, even in the truth movement. There's a lot of misinformation, disinformation, and you better go back to your Bible and rightly divide it so that you don't get deceived because there's been a lot of Jesuits and a lot of Illuminati and Satanists and Luciferians that have played like they're this and that, and they have put this stuff out there. That's why the only truth we have, folks, is this right here. The, the word of Almighty God, the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. We got truth right here, and you have to rightly divide it. You can't take one passage here or there. I love what Brother Kenneth Hagin said years ago. He said, you know, you make the Bible say anything you want. You make the Bible say, you know, the Bible says Judas went and hanged himself. Then you can pull up the verse in Luke 15 where he's talking to the Good Samaritan and say, go thou and do likewise. Well, if you take those two verses out of context, you can say Judas went and hanged himself, go thou and do likewise. I mean, you, you can't do that with the Bible. It has to be put together. So when we're talking about end-time Bible prophecy, you can't just take the, the good things. Yes, God's going to pour out his Holy Spirit, and there's going to be a great revival and a great harvest of souls. But he says that's also going to be in the midst of the great tribulation of a time so so terrible that we've never even seen anything like it. And you have to be able to take the good and the bad. You have to take the positive and the negative. You have to take it all and put it together to get the whole story. So... We're going to take a quick break. I mean, I'm, I'm wrong. I could just preach on, man. I'm, I'm getting fired up now, but we'll, we'll, we'll continue this in just a moment. We need to, I need to take a drink of water anyway. But listen, folks, you're listening to Prophecy Quake. I'm your host, Pastor Dean Odell. We're live here with my, my co-host, Kevin Wilkinson. I don't give him an opportunity to talk too much. Um, but he's back there nodding his head, so he agrees. That's a good thing. To agree, it's done. Um, but we are live here in East Central Alabama. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, not long, just a few minutes. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Okay, we're back. I'm your host, Pastor Dean Odell. We're covering tonight the Jesuit deception of preterism. I've been covering the lie that God is done with Israel and the Jewish people. Now, I, I'm going to make a statement here because Kevin informed me during the break that we have some people on YouTube and probably, probably that are not commenting. Some are. If you say, that the Jews that are in Israel today are not the real Jews. And I mean, if you say all of them, okay, if you say all of the people that return that claim Jewish heritage, Jewish ethnicity, Jewish genetics, or the Jewish, Jewish culture, religion, whatever you want to say, if you say that all of the people in Israel today that claim to be Jews are not, I'm telling you what you're doing. You are deceived and you're making, you're saying God is a liar. Because God said he did not forsake his people, which he foreknew. Speaking of the Jewish people. And he said that Israel would be saved in the end. And he made a clear distinction in the book of Romans, what we just read a minute ago, between the Gentile and the Jew. And in fact, in Romans 1.16, where Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is... Uh, unto the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. He even puts a preference of the gospel for the Jew. And the Bible is clear. God said in Isaiah chapter 11 that he was going to bring back his people to the land of Jerusalem. And that's also in Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39. He would have his people, a Jewish people. So again, if you say that, if you've bought into the propaganda within the truth, truther movement that's been infiltrated by Jesuits and New Agers and all kind of other nutcases, 
If you take their word over what the word of God says plainly and teaches, then you are deceived, you're a liar, and you're calling God a liar. Now, if that hurts your feelings, so be it. I'm sorry. This is foolishness. Now, now, can there be some who claim they're Jews and are not? Yes, there are some. There are some who claim they're Christians and they're not. Okay? If you want to say there's some, I will agree with you. Yes, there's some Jews in Israel that claim to be Jews and they're not Jews. But if you put that blanket over everything, then you're denying the Bible. You're denying the Word of God. You're denying prophecy. And you've bought into the propaganda. Let me tell you, I feel more that the scripture in Revelation, he's talking to the church of Philadelphia, and he says, you know, I know those who say they're Jews and are not, but do lie. And he said, I know the blasphemy of them. I would say that fits more into some of the extremes of the Hebraic roots movement who are a bunch of Gentiles claiming to be Jews and they're not. And they end up blaspheming the Lord and talking about that Jesus is not God in the flesh and they don't believe in the Trinity anymore. That's a lot closer to reality than claiming that some Jews in it, that all the Jews in Israel are not true Jews. That, that whole thing about the Northern European, whatever, all of that is a lie. It is a deception. It's been dealt with. It's been debunked a long, long time ago. But, folks, it doesn't matter whether it's been debunked or not. The Word of God debunks it. So so stop. Just stop with the foolishness. Because, see, here's what Jesus said to the Jews, talking about their house, their temple on the Temple Mount. Here's what he said to them, the Jewish people that had rejected him. This is Luke 13, 35. Let's read it. He says, see, he says, your house is left to you desolate. So he was talking about the judgment coming upon the Jewish people that rejected him, upon Jerusalem, upon the temple. And he says, your house is left unto you desolate. And assuredly, I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, who? Just the world in general? No, he was speaking to the Jewish people the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham. And he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So he's saying there, there's going to be a period where your house is left unto you desolate. But when I do return, there'll be a group of you restored. There'll be a group of you ready to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, look, look, notice how Jesus says, he says, your house is desolate. Then he will not be seen until they call upon him. In other words, they will be scattered first, then sometime in the future they will repent and call upon him. Did Israel call upon the Lord Jesus in 70 AD with the Roman army surrounding them? No, they didn't call on Jesus. No, a million died and they were scattered to the nations. No. See, the end time Bible prophecies are very clear. Jesus said, when you won't see me again until you say blessed is he. That hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen in the near future. Did, did, did they see him? Did, did, <laughs> did the Jews under siege in, in, of Titus and the Roman armies, did they see the Lord? Did they turn to the Lord? Was there a remnant that cried out to Jesus? No. Now, see, the president... <laughs> The preterists, they say that, uh, you know, they didn't see him. So that would make the word of God a lie. Jesus said they're going to see him. Kevin, is that what it says in Luke 13? And that's what I'm looking at. So see, that would mean he didn't come as he said, or as they say, in 78. It's just not possible. That's, that this whole preterist nonsense is, is even, I, frankly, I don't even see how it's a legitimate conversation among Christians. Um, let's keep going with this same thought. Now, the Word of God says the nation of Israel must first look to the one whom they've pierced and plead for his return. When this is done, they will receive their cleansing. The cleansing of Israel's sin is connected to the second coming. The one condition, they must repent and call upon it. Let's read Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look Unto me, whom they have pierced. They will look unto Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach. They will look unto the one they pierced, they crucified. 
and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn son. Did that happen in 70 AD? No, nope, did not. Um, here, the second coming of Jesus, it says all the tribes of the earth mourn. Did that happen? Did all, again, I, I know I'm repeating some things that I said in the beginning, but you know, Israel is to plead for their Messiah to return. And they're going to mourn for him as one mourns for their only son. Israel must confess their national sin of unbelief. That is what meant when they say, they'll say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they say, when they say blessed is he, they're talking about blessed is Jesus. Right now, the Jews don't, don't accept Jesus, the vast majority. They do not. And he's saying here, Matthew 24, 30, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, as well as the Jews that are left, the remnant. He says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. Who mourned in 70 AD? Not the Romans. Not anyone. So all the tribes of the earth did not mourn. But according to preterism, oh, the Jewish people mourned. How did, they come, how, how did Jesus come with great power then? How did he deliver them? Where was the remnant that, that was all of Israel being saved? You see, none of this, <laughs> through the Roman armies that, that destroyed Jerusalem, I mean, hardly the fulfilling of these prophecies according to the way they're written. I mean, preterism is just a disaster, folks. It is a disaster. I use uh, President Trump, some of his descriptions. It's a disaster. It's like Obamacare. It's a disaster. Now, here it even gets worse. I mean, they try to say that 70 AD, everything was filled, even Armageddon, that 70 AD in Titus and Jerusalem and all, that was Armageddon. That's what they say. And I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm wondering, I'm like, have they not read? Did, have they not read Ezekiel 38 and 39? Have they not read Revelation 16? Do, do they not read these things? Look at this, folks. All the nations come at Armageddon, not just the Romans. It's not just the Romans. And he said, I saw the beast. This is Revelation 19, 19 through 20. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, multiple kings, and their armies gathered together to make war against him, who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, uh, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive in a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him, Jesus, who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now, now this is Jesus at the second coming, Revelation 19, destroying the armies of the world that's gathered together to fight him and to fight the remnant of the Jewish people. He destroys them all. All the kings of the earth, that are all these armies. Not Did Titus get destroyed in 70 AD? No, he didn't get destroyed. Kevin, did Titus and his Roman legions get destroyed in 70 AD by the Lord Jesus Christ? No, and that's pretty well proven in history too. Right, exactly. So, as we can see, it is not the Roman armies that God uses in Armageddon, but the Messiah, all by himself, is the one that's going to defeat all these armies. And you think about it, was, was the beast Nero? How was Nero the beast? He was cap Nero was not captured and put in hell, like it says, by the Lord Jesus. He died a few, listen to this, Nero, who preterists say was the beast, the Antichrist of the tribulation period that ended in 70 AD, he died before 70 AD. Come on, man. What are you doing out there? I'm going to tell you what you're doing. It's called armchair theologians. You listen to somebody and you don't read and study your Bibles. Here's what he said. Again, all nations come in Armageddon. This is Zechariah 14, 2 through 5. He says, God speaking, I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the, the, the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. So the Lord's saying, yeah, these nations are going to come, and it's going to be bad, but there's going to be a remnant, and they're going to be saved. 
And in that day, his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives, with faces uh, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall he split in two from east to west. I've stood on the Mount of Olives. It hasn't been split in two. Making a very large valley, half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half toward the south. And then it shall flee through, through my mountain, the valley, and the mountain valley shall reach to Azel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. So there you have it. This, this did not happen in 70 AD, folks. Preterism misses so much. Again, the Bible says that all nations are gathered against Israel, Jerusalem, not just the single nation of Rome like 70 AD. This is how the Bible describes Armageddon. It is the Lord's return that vanquishes the nations that have come to fight it. I mean, I mean, does the scripture say the Lord fights against the nations coming against Israel or he fights against Israel with the pagan Roman armies? What, what does it say? What does it say, Kevin? <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't say that God's with Rome, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, Rome, God would definitely be against Rome in this scenario. It, it's amazing. In 70 AD, did, did the feet of Jesus touch down on the Mount of Olives and split it? No, that didn't happen in 70 AD. Listen, those of you out there believing it, I know, I know you've been... You, 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 you've heard this from people you respect and you think, oh, they're great teachers and they're great men of God. Um, I remember the first time I heard it. I heard it from a person I thought she was, the, was one of the most anointed women of God and I'm listening to this and, and, and just, you know, warning flags, red flags are going up over and over inside of me. I'm like, that's not what the Word of God says, not what the Bible says, not what the Bible says. And... Uh, he goes on to say, it says, when Christ descends to the Mount of Olives, there will be a great earthquake and the way will be opened up east and west. And there will be a waterway through the Persian Gulf. Jerusalem will become a seaport with its own waterway. And the size of Jerusalem will be significantly larger. The temple will be about one mile square. I mean, do we need to go into all the details that the Bible describes to come to the conclusion that this did not happen in 70 AD? I mean, it just didn't. And, and, and that, you know, I mean, this, this is my last slide here, but, but we're going to go through some more scriptures. I mean, think of the things that, that they're trying to say Jesus came and, and the, all the end time prophecies happened. And you look like, okay, look at Revelation 6. Revelation 6. Here's what happens at the second coming of Jesus here, Okay. This is what it says in the sixth seal. And we're not there yet. The sixth seal is coming. And he says, I beheld him when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. The stars of heaven fell. That hasn't happened. The stars are still up there. It hasn't happened. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven, and I believe this is talking about the solid firmament, will depart as a scroll when it is rolled together. Now listen to this. It says here, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Every island and mountain. Kevin, does that say every island and mountain are moved out of their places? It does say that, and it is not just some or one or two. It is every. Did, did that happen in 70 AD? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Did heaven open up in 70 AD? No. And every eye see him. Look what it says. Verse 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Did that happen in 70 AD? No. The heavens that hide the Lord from us, that that glass that we see through darkly, the sky, the firmament, the solid firmament, yes. Has it ever been rolled back and every eye can see him seated upon the throne? It's not recorded anywhere in history that I'm aware of. No. I would say this might get reported in some historian's book somewhere if yes. this happened all over the world. Did not. 
Folks, I'm telling you again, this idea that all Bible prophecy, and particularly end time Bible prophecy, was fulfilled in 70 AD is ridiculous, ludicrous foolishness. It is complete deception, and it's causing people to be blinded from what's happening around them, the signs to look at, the players to understand who the players are, and to, to know the deceptions and the lies to, to look out for, and to be able to discern the season that you're living in so that you'll act accordingly. This is important. Okay, that's, that's just one. Let's, let's look at the, something else in Revelation. Let's, let's look at the, at the judgment of the great whore. Well, 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 let's go to Revelation 16 first. Let's look at Armageddon and what happens around it. Revelation 16. I want everybody to turn there. We're going to go to this with the sixth angel, verse 12. Revelation 16, verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Has the Euphrates River been dried up? I mean, for this great battle of Armageddon. Did that happen in, in, in uh, 70 AD? No, it didn't. In fact, it wasn't until the 1990s that the Turkish government built the Ataturk dams on the Euphrates River and now have the ability to turn off the Euphrates River so that downstream in Syria and Iraq and uh, Iran, they can cut it off and the Euphrates River can be dried up. So that wasn't even a possibility until the 1990s. Uh, but it's going to happen in the near future where they cut it off so this invading army from the east can move toward Jerusalem for the battle of Armageddon. And that's what he goes on to say. Verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth. Now listen to this. And of the whole earth to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. So these evil spirits are going to go out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, the false and the false prophet, the Antichrist and the false prophet, these three entities, two of them are men, and these demon spirits are going to go out of their mouth, and it says they're going to gather forth the kings of the earth of the whole earth. Is that what it says in your Bible, Kevin? Of the whole earth there? That's what I'm looking at in the good King James Version. <laughs> he says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together. So where are they calling these kings of the world to this great battle? It says, He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon or the Valley of Megiddo in Israel. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of, of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Now, folks, it is not done until all this happens right here. And he says here, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Now, the great city was divided. He's talking about that earthquake where Jesus sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives that we read in Zechariah going to be divided into three parts. Then he says this will happen. The cities of the nations will fall. This earthquake will be so powerful that over the entire earth, all the cities, these wicked cities scattered all over the earth, all of them will fall. Kevin, is that what it says? And all means all. Did that happen in 70 AD? No. No, it did not. He says in all the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And, the, and Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church. Babylon is the city of Rome. It is not Israel. It is not America. It is not the world system. He's talking about the cities of the nations fell. And then he talks about Babylon, that great Babylon, another city came in remembrance, and it's called that great city in Revelation 17. And, and in Revelation 17, he says that at that time when John was writing this in 95 AD, he says that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Well, at that time, the word reigneth is a present tense Greek verb, which means right now, presently. He was talking about Rome. He identified the city, the city on seven hills. All right. And I'm going to just say this, that seven mountain mandate thing, 
It is a Roman Catholic doctrine. You hear what I'm saying? She is the whore. She is the mystery Babylon that sits on seven mountains. I mean, they're even telling you this stuff originates with the whore, with the Jesuits. Now, again, they may be completely deceived and bought into this, but the Jesuits infiltrated our churches, big ministries, especially big charismatic ministries, and the Jesuits infiltrated these things, and they put all this Roman Catholic influence in here. And part of it is to divert attention away from who they are. The final pope will be the false prophet who will work with the Antichrist and the United Nations as it forms into a world government. And they will institute a one-world money system that's cashless with something implanted in your hand and your forehead. And you will be forced to submit. And the last three and a half years of that nonsense is going to be what Jesus called the great tribulation, such as there was never a time. And the church is going to be here. The true Christians are going to be here. And we're going to be a great light in the midst of that darkness. And that's the purpose of it. We need to be warning people ready that they should be ready to endure persecution, martyrdom. They should be ready to endure financial collapse, not being able to buy or sell. No, but what are we doing? We're telling everything, the, the preterism is, no, the world's going to get better and better. Everything's going to be wonderful. We're just going to prosper, and the world's going to become Christianized, and, and we're going to make it so wonderful, Jesus will, will want to come back. And, and, and look at the beautif beautification that we've accomplished. Not the way it's going to be. We're going to be light in the darkness, in the chaos in the judgment, in the, in the chaos of Satan and his people that they're causing in the midst of the judgment of God. And we're going to be light in that darkness. You should want to be. I want to be here. I want to see it all. I want to be here and be preaching as all of this is happening. He says here, that, that great Babylon came in remembrance to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And look again, see, see, this is where I've told somebody, you know, this is the sixth seal and the, the sixth and seventh trumpet. They, they happen at the same time because you see the same thing. Look at verse 20. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. This is every island moving and the mountains coming down. God talks about this in the, in the old covenant concerning the, that all the mountains come down. Think about that for a second. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven and every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Did that happen in 70 AD all over the world? No, it didn't. Absolute foolishness that we believe this stuff. Look at, let's look at the end of Revelation uh, 18 when he talks about the judgment of the great whore, the wicked city, the mystery Babylon that's Rome. He says this here, verse 20, this is Revelation 18, verse 20. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you of her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city of Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and the musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman in whatsoever shall craft he shall be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard. He's saying that Mystery Babylon, I believe it's Rome, and I can prove it, but Mystery Babylon says nothing, nobody, there's not going to be any workers in you anymore. There's not going to be any uh, light of a candle in you anymore. The voice of the bride, the bride, the voice of Jesus, the voice of the church is not going to be in you anymore. And did that happen in 70 AD, Kevin? And it says about this mystery Babylon, the great whore, it says in her was found the, the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And boy, I can tell you, we, we could take, we could take, another show again and we've done this in the past i've taught this many times but again we have so many new listeners viewers now that I, that's why i'm going back over material that we've covered but there's no doubt that mystery babylon is the roman catholic church matter of fact let's we we have a little bit of time 
Uh, let's turn back to Revelation 17. Let's just identify her, just for those of you who may be skeptical, you know, because you bought into some of these, you know, fancy modern teachings. Uh, the reformers, like I said, all the reformers, the great John Wesley, they all knew that Revelation 17 18 identified the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, the Pope. Let's look at it. Let's read Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Unto me, come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And here it is. Here's one of your clues. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls and having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Folks, couldn't be more clear. There's two power structures within the Roman Catholic Church, the cardinals and the bishops. The cardinals wear red, scarlet, and the bishops wear purple. There you have it. There's your first clue. Then he says that they are decked with gold and precious stones, pearls, having a golden cup. Just watch when the Pope, any Pope, does a mass. He is holding a golden cup. And he says that cup in her hand is full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And the word fornication is pornea, and it means both sexual, real sexual immorality, but it also means spiritual immorality and idolatry. So that teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that it's the literal blood and it's the literal body of Jesus when they teach and that it's to bow, be bowed down to and worshiped and believe that it's real when it's a symbol. And he talks about that because they lift that cup to the Eucharist or the sunburst, which is a representation of the sun god Ra. And they lift it up to the statues of the Virgin Mary, which is another deep, dark idolatry within the Roman Catholic Church. Oh, but we don't want to upset anybody. We don't want to say anybody's an idolater that's actually bowing to a statue of Mary. We, we want to ignore facts and we want to ignore reality. I know there's some wonderful, sweet Catholic people, but there's some wonderful, sweet Buddhists and some wonderful, sweet Hindus and some wonderful, sweet, peaceful Muslims. And there's a bunch of wonderful, sweet people out there that are lost and idolaters and in sin and deceived and they don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And just because they're nice and sweet and have good intentions does not mean they are going to be saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb and go to heaven when they die. So we've got to quit this stuff. We've got to tell people the truth. Whether they're Roman Catholic worshiping Mary, praying to Mary and saints, or they're a Buddhist praying to Buddha, or praying with Buddha, or meditating with, to, with Buddha, or whether a Hindu, like when I went to the island of Mauritius, and they're offering food to these statues of the different Hindu gods like Krishna and Vishnu and all these different things. It's, it's no different. We need to tell people the truth. Leave this sin, the sin of idolatry. It's clear, Romans uh, I mean, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 5. It says if, if a brother is an idolater, he will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says if, if, if we know a brother who's an idolater, a brother or sister, and they won't come out of that idolatry, we're supposed to not even eat with them until they repent. We should have no fellowship with Catholics who are still praying to Mary, still bowing to statues, still going to Mass and bowing to the Eucharist, the sunburst, and, 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 and all that foolishness. It is an entire system of deception and idolatry, and we should be, have the boldness and the guts to pull them out of it and tell them the truth than to let them continue in deception and end up in hell. But see, I'm, I'm going to tell you what, soon here I'm going to get on some of these charismatic leaders that have been pushing the Roman Catholic Church as something that's okay, and they don't bring up any of this stuff. I'm sick of it. And we got a bunch of, uh, I'm just going to tell you, I get on my own. Pentecostals and Charismatics are some of the most ignorant people. They're ignorant of the Scriptures. They're ignorant of church history. They're ignorant of reality around them. And all they worry about is, you know, feeling goosebumps, getting a prophecy, 
of how they're going to prosper or how God's going to use them in a mighty way, but they have no guts to stand up and speak the truth. They have no guts to speak in the word of God. They have no, no guts to bring rebuke, correction, or instruction to bring people out of sin and out of darkness and out of stuff that will destroy them. You know, I like the old time preacher. I remember Leonard Ravenhill said the Roman Catholic Church was the greatest forgery Lucifer ever made. As a man of God, I'm going to tell you, I, I can tell you the depth of a man of God by where he stands on the Roman Catholic Church and if he's willing to say. It's not enough just to believe it, the truth about it. You, do you say it? That's another issue. He goes on, verse 5, and it says, Upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and of the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And I saw her and I wondered with great ad admiration. See here, this is, this is where I just stand in awe. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here going, 70 AD, where was the whore? Where were the Christians? I know a lot of them say, well, that was Rome was killing the Christians, but that was just the beginning. Have we forgotten that the, the Roman Empire that changed from political and military garb to religious garb that came to the Roman Catholic Church also tried to stamp out Protestant Christianity? The Inquisitions? The Thirty Years' War was to stamp out Protestants, to kill. They killed millions. They tortured, burned at the stake, mutilated, and killed. The Roman Catholic Church's guilt has so much blood, so much blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus that the Apostle John just was overwhelmed. He was blown away when he saw this woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And the angel said unto me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, Say, well, that part confused me. I don't understand what he's talking about. Don't worry about it. Here is the mind that has wisdom, he's telling you. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Seven mountains. Rome is known as the city on seven hills or seven mountains. And there are seven kings. Five have fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he has come, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns that thou sawest are ten kings which shall receive, uh, which have received no kingdom as yet, but shall receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These will have one mind. They shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So he's saying these, these guys are going to get together and have one mind. They're going to be unified, united nations, united kings. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And they that are with him are uh, called, chosen, and faithful. He saith unto me, The waters which you saw, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns that thou saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and they shall make her desolate and naked, and they shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman that thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. I mean, it, it, it can't be more clear. That's what I was talking about. The Roman Catholic Church. You people, people talk about <laughs> it's America. Well, first of all, America's colors are not scarlet and purple. We're red, white, and blue. Second of all, it goes on into Revelation 18, talks about her great wealth. America is, what, are we approaching $20 trillion in debt? The Roman Catholic Church is the wealthiest entity on the face of the earth, period. That's a fact. Especially when you bring into the 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 you know the choice of land and artwork and artifacts and things that they hold and that they've been pilfering Christians for centuries. There's no telling what's underneath in those Vatican archives, um, the catacombs. There's just no telling. Um, the 
everything that's under that's under there. So, folks, I mean, and and if that wasn't enough, Revelation eighteen, where he says this about her, when he, Jesus speaking here through the Lord speaking, he says, "For I heard another voice from heaven." This is Revelation eighteen four. So I heard another voice from heaven saying, "Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, then that you receive not her plagues." For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, double unto her, double according to her works, and the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. And then he says, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she said in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues shall come in one day, death, mourning, famine. Here, when it says this entity, this whore, this great whore that sits upon seven hills and upon many waters that has influence over the world and the kings of the earth, it says that she says, I sit a queen. The Greek word is basilisa. Basilisa, which is where the word basilica comes from. So she says, I sit a basilica. What do they call what do they call the basilica at in Rome, the great one? It's St. Peter's Basilica. Basilica. I see it, a basilica. Folks, all I know to do is try to tell you the truth. Anything that comes out of the great whore is filth, perversion, false teaching, deception, idolatry. The doctrine of preterism. Concerning the end times. All the every bit of it is a lie. Every bit of it is a deception to distract you from the truth of what you need to do to get ready and to be a light and to endure what's coming. You know, I, I was talking to somebody the other day about this, and I said, you know. People always bring up, well, well, wait a minute now. You know, when you start talking about this, we, we're not supposed to know the times and the seasons. And I love how, again, we've been taught these things out of their context. First Thessalonians chapter 5. When he tells the disciples, not for you to know the times and the seasons. And then he says, but when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them like travail upon a woman with a child they shall not escape. He says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So you have to take the whole thing in context. He's saying to the first century, he was saying to those first century believers, Guess what? It's not, you don't need to worry about that right now. This is all for a future. He says, but when they say, he gives you a sign to look for. And then he says, but you, brethren, you won't be in darkness that that day. That day. And, he, and what brethren is he talking about? Those who would be alive in that day. He says, that day will not overtake you as a thief. We are the generation. When Jesus was talking about the generation that would see all these things, Kevin, put up, put up uh, Luke 21, I think it's verse 22. Let me look it up to be sure. But see, here's the key to this whole thing. Revelation, I mean, I'm sorry, Luke 21. Pretty sure I got it right, but let me go ahead and turn there. I know we're... Close to the end of the show here. Yeah, verse 22. See, the key to this is, did some of these things happen in 70 AD? Yes, it was a prophecy Jesus gave that Jerusalem would be destroyed and they would be scattered. That came to pass. It did. But then he makes this statement. This is Luke chapter 21, verse 22. This is Jesus speaking. He said, so he's referring to a different day because he said, for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. All things. Man, we just went through, Kevin, did we not go through a bunch of things? And, and I didn't cover them all. But a bunch of things that have not been fulfilled, right? Oh, that's right. And I mean, just the sheer number that we didn't even cover. No, I mean, it's, it's, it, there's no way to cover it. I mean, we couldn't even get them all in, in this week, probably. <laughs> no. But, yeah, I mean, and all that has to be fulfilled. Jesus, when he's talking about, so Luke 21, he's talking about all these things. We're talking about the final day, the final years, a specific time at the end when all the prophecies written 
will be fulfilled. And we're watching them take place. Um, you know, I've spent the last eight years. God spoke to me to get back on this in two thousand. Well, really, nine years coming on it. Not that I didn't teach it in my earlier years as a minister, but I did. But I, I got away from it for a while and was teaching and preaching on other things. But the Lord was like, you get back on this end time prophecy, second coming of Jesus. And even in the last nine years, the Lord has taught me things that just have blown my mind, the fulfillment of things that specific fulfillments and i've written about them dnodal.org go to the article section i mean the articles like the the four horsemen isis and the second coming of jesus the seven trumpets of revelation um you know isis i mean the rise of islam russia and the coming nuclear war uh, the beast the whore and the dragon all those articles this is just things that god has stirred and led me to study and delve into and I mean, I've just been so amazed at how many prophecies have been fulfilled in just recent years and recent decades and others that are in the process. We are the generation. I was born in 1967. I believe the generation Jesus was talking about in Luke 21 in Matthew 24 when he said this generation shall not pass. And he says the generation that will see these things, the generation that sees these things begin to come to pass. He said that generation will not pass until all is fulfilled. Folks, that didn't, all was not fulfilled in AD 70. So preterism is a false doctrine. It is a false eschatology, theology, meant to distract you from the real players in the end time. The Roman Catholic Church, Mystery Babylon, the false prophet, the final pope, the Antichrist who will take over the world government as the UN morphs, the money system, that couldn't, that the, the digital, the implant in your hand and forehead money system where it says no one will be able to buy or sell unless they have this. That didn't happen in AD 7. Folks, it's time out there. It's time. My charismatic brethren, Pentecostals out there that have been duped, and I'm going to say some names, duped by the false teaching of end times by Bill Johnson, Wall Now, Rick Joyner, C. Peter Wagner. Again, some of those guys love Jesus. I believe some of them are, are not who they say they are. But I'm telling you, whether it's intentional or it's just um, ignorance, it's still putting forth. If you teach this preterism, you're teaching a Roman Catholic doctrine that was infiltrated into the church by Jesuits going all the way back to the 1600s, and they have succeeded in duping you here in 2017 at the very end when we should be awake. We should be awake. We should be knowledgeable. We should be alert to what's happening, what's being fulfilled. So, folks, I'm about out of time tonight. I think we got about three minutes. Um, listen, if I hurt your feelings, just know this. Jesus hurt plenty of people's feelings because he spoke the truth that was uncomfortable even to his own people, even to religious leaders, even to religious people, Jews, Israelites around him. He, at times, he made his own disciples uncomfortable. He told Peter one time, Satan, get behind me. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he made people uncomfortable sometimes because he loved them. You know, open rebuke is better than secret love. Uh, I believe that's Proverbs 27. It's, it's better to hear the blunt truth and receive it and get into the word of God and repent and change and start obeying God and following God according to scripture and get prepared for what's coming and to understand, to discern the times and seasons you're living in than to keep being duped by big ministries that have been duped themselves. A big ministry is no sign of the Holy Spirit moving. And the Holy Spirit, what's interesting is a lot of people say the Holy Spirit could be moving in a ministry and healing. It doesn't mean that they understand Bible prophecy. This is where, you know, I'm telling you, a lot of my charismatic Pentecostal brothers, they worship miracles. They really do. A lot of it, seeking healing and miracles. And I'm all for that. I believe in that. I've seen it. I want more of it. But all of that seems to get in the way of making sure that you're rightly dividing the word of God. And I don't care. There can be a place where miracles are happening. You know, a recent charismatic leader just said, oh, there's a lot of miracles happening in the Roman Catholic Church. I'm going to tell you what, those are false miracles. Those are demonic miracles. 
because that system is demonic and I am full of idolatry and deception. So, look, it's time to wake up. Get back to the Word of God on all this stuff. And uh, anyway, we're out of time. I'm Pastor Dean Odell. This has been Prophecy Quake with uh, my co-host, Kevin Wilkinson. We're out of time tonight. We love you. Get in the Word of God. Preterism, false teaching. Get back to Scripture. God bless.